it's beyond you know, can a studio realistically spend three years yeah. with 50 people working on a game mm. and hit the market after at that, you know, that yeah, point? They can't afford to yeah. not have a dream. Well, it's a hideous risk. Su- success game, and obviously no, not all games are. Yeah. yeah, well, it's a hideous risk. Even if you do the best thing and you get critical acclaim, everything. Yeah. I mean, it's just... Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, the, you, you've you got it in the old days, the publishers, they'd even come down here to Melbourne and, the, you know, they'd commission X number of games from here. They might do three or four similar games and I know they're only going yeah. to publish one or yeah, two. But, you, you know, if you, as long as you get one hit in five, you, mm. you're covered. covered yeah. But these days, it doesn't work quite like that. The money's just too much spending. Yeah. It's interesting that with the Xbox 360 that they've got that whole arcade section, which is, you know, much smaller games, more casual-style games, because there's obviously... Yeah, well, some it? kind of understanding there both for audiences and for developers that we just can't keep making those huge games. Mm. Well, there's Everyone actually wants to play for you or so anyway. Well, there's actually a big trend back to the retro style games anyway mm. because the one thing that hasn't improved much with technology is the gameplay. To be mm. honest, yeah. not the not the original sort of quirky yeah, gameplay yeah, you get yeah. the, the core yeah. gameplay in the eighties or you know the early early eighties. That hasn't really. You know, obviously Mario and Sonic mm. and everything move the bar a little bit, but um, people are still relying more on fancy graphics and stuff to, to get the experience across. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. Okay. My phone's off. <coughs> My phone's off. I'd never have it on. <laughs> My phone's off in another room. I, don't <laughs> I just bought it in case I couldn't find ACMI. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Because you're a technophobe. <laughs> technophobe, yeah, I hate technology. That's right. Just okay. one moment. As you sat back, I'll just go with that focus. Okay. This rings back East Reed memories. That was on last week, too. East Reed, yeah. Yeah, I was always being interviewed by TV stations and things over there. This, this is a smaller like version of it. <laughs> yeah, it's much smaller. <laughs> much kinder. Yeah, in E3, what happened is, well, what happened here more or less? Somebody comes and gets you, they take you here. <laughs> then a pretty girl comes and gets you and takes you somewhere else. And you're getting carried around all, all day. <laughs> so, anyway. This is E3 light. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, do you, we'll start with um, talking about your background and some biographical information about who you are, how you got started in gaming, your background, what you wanted to do. Okay, my background, how I got started in games. Um, well, I think going to the end first, I think I joined Beam in 1982, if memory serves. That was after a computer science course at Melbourne University. Um, I suppose I, I had programmed some sort of half games at home, just fiddling around to learn how to use a computer before I applied for the Beam job. Um, I suppose my major interests in those days were sort of programming and film, and I was going to go one way, or well, I was going to, I was thinking of heading up the Australian Film School actually there in Sydney, and then um, I got in, sort of involved in games a little bit, so I, I, I decided to combine both things, c- computer programming and film more or less, and turn it into a game career. Well, that wasn't initially going to be a career, but it sort of kept going and going and going. And were you actually recruited through Melbourne University? Like, how did it, how did you find? No, out? you didn't recruit through Melbourne <laughs> University in those days. As I found out later on, because I tried recruiting through Melbourne University, and yeah, if you're a serious computer programmer at Melbourne Uni, you'd have jobs at the big mining companies or the public service or something lined up by year one. Um, no, I I saw a an advert in possibly the Age, I imagine, uh, just wanting a programmer. In those days, that was quite rare, but it said a um, programmer to work on a game in South Melbourne. It hasn't happened. I've already been out to what turned out to be Beams or Melbourne House in those days' office in South Melbourne to buy an adventure game from the States. They used to distribute uh-huh. um, adventure games and other games from the States and Britain. So I turned up there. There was, I think, there was three programmers or something, and um, I showed them this thing, a sort of a pole position game I'd worked on, well, just myself, just the car driving around the track. And, yeah, I walked out with the job, basically. <laughs> Easy as that. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think it was going to be much competition, to be honest, <laughs> in those days. <laughs> so when you walked in there, there's like three other people, so it would have been Veronica Megler and... Uh, for, no, they'd, they'd finished the original, they'd just finished the original version of The Hobbit, so the, 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 the other people there were, were Fred, Alfred Milgram, yeah. who, who was running the company, it was his company with his wife, Naomi Bezin, who was in charge of marketing. Um, Adam Lanceman came on as the as the accountant. Um, 
then the programming side were Phil Mitchell, William Tang, yeah. and um, they just hired a young guy, um, Alan Blake, I believe. Right. Um, so that was the the whole staff at that point. Unbelievable. What was well, it? well, sorry, there were salespeople. There was yeah. Sue Anderson in charge of sales, and, and you know there was there was some administrative stuff, some people going on to help the publishing wing, because. Um, Remember being what being my own Melbourne house, so we were a game publisher as well. Yeah, and um, when in the early days when you were working there with just the three of you, what was it like? We did. What was it like working on games in that kind of environment? Well, I think we hired a few people a bit f pretty fast because if I remember, one of the things we started pretty early was a a book of games, thirty games for the Vic Twenty and then the Commodore Six when that came out, um, and. But yeah, it was well. It was a small office, although not much smaller than by today's standards, I suppose. Um, it was classic pioneering stuff, I suppose. Yeah, it was it was a sort of microcosm of what it is today. Because the, even though we thought the deadlines were tight and they were, we were working long hours and we had you know we had three months to finish something, whereas today you might get two years to finish something. It still was a microcosm of that because you'd spend your three months and then the last month of it you'd be working you know all night and stuff. So mm -hmm. it was. It, that really hasn't changed until the last year or so, to be honest, in the game industry as a whole. So it was pretty much just a subset of how it was. And I suppose the biggest difference in those days, we reverse engineered everything. If we wanted to do a game on the Coleco, the Intellivision, and, 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 and bigger than all the Nintendo when that came out, the NES, there wasn't anybody telling, there wasn't any manuals, there wasn't anybody saying how to do it. You had to take the machine, take the chips out, reverse engineer it, and see what it did and then start programming it from there. So you'd start with a game that you, someone may have, one of you may have programmed for, say, one of the machines, and then you want to make it for the 64 instead, so you're reverse and recreating the entire game? Well, no, if you're pointing to the 64, the 64 came out a little bit later, and that was one of the, with the Atari line, which we didn't actually, I don't think we did anything on the Atari mm -hmm. line, other than the 2600, the original console. The 64, when it came out, it, it was a, it was a clear, the, the specs were clear on that machine. It was a 6502 process. Everybody knew what it was meant to okay. do, and you could more or less figure that out. There was a bit of research with the graphic technology. But you're importing a game. The core, even in the, those days, the engineering disciplines we used were pretty good. Um, and I, I, from my point of view, I was always insistent on using software engineering to make sure everything was portable as, as well as you could make it. So, in, say, in the, in the example of The Hobbit, Phil, Phil Mitchell, who, with, as you said, Veronica Megler and, and Fred, did the original Hobbit on the um, spectrum, spectrum. They did the core set. The, um, well, they, they had a core set of routines where you could, you know, they put things on the screen and, the, and they get the I.O. and all that sort of stuff. And then they had the actual game-specific stuff, which was the language for, you know, so people could type in open door and, and this and that, and that'll go through. So all that stuff, the language stuff and, and the parts, that stayed the same between machines, and you would just do a simple port of that. So it wasn't, you know, you weren't starting from scratch. You were right. just porting it, although in those days you you really couldn't afford to start from scratch. And I mean, I know we're going to talk about The Hobbit later, I suppose, but a classic example, I can remember I was coding the first com the first Commodore Hobbit, which was a tape version, a cassette version, and I was using a, a cassette-based assembler to compile it, so it would take the files off the cassette, and this was before there was such a thing as a floppy disk. And the the, the final, they were... We were on a deadline, and it was the deadline was a couple of days after the um, what was going to was turned out to be the America's Cup when right. when Australia two won the America's Cup, and the night that the final race, the night that Australia two won the America's Cup, I remember that because I was up all night. I started a tape assembly of the Hobbit before the race started, and it hadn't finished by the time the race had done. So for a whole yacht race, we was assembling one program. Now I've I've known people in recent times that have that have compiled a single program to get rid of errors, anything up to 100 times in 10 minutes. So it's, times have changed. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Tell, can you um, talk a little bit about some of the games? Like, let's talk about the way of Exploding Fist that you designed and programmed. Yeah, right. I, was, yeah I was a lead programmer. We had a couple other, we had one other guy working on it, Bruce Bailey. Um, and David Johnston. Um, yeah, the Exploding Fist was, there was, Pro, well, it was the first multi-move combat game ever made. I think um, on the on the Apple, um, a game called Karateka came out just before we released Fist, which had basically punch and kick, which wasn't much of a karate simulation. 
so th- this was put you know, we wanted something it was an idea I came up with I, I did know that one of the Japanese arcade companies was doing a, a karate game so and that actually came out before fist so fist ended up sort of you know, being compared a little bit to that but um, it was to get well, it was just to have something first to get something out there that was unique and new, and, and it was to do a and it was a what we designed a game which I think it had sixteen karate moves, all based on the on the Commodore joystick initially, and then the keyboard on the Spectrum. Um, it w- what can I say? It was a fun game to do. It was a game it was one of these games you think you you know there's pressure on you. Can you finish it? Can you finish it? But when you look at it, oh, it only took you know four months or something. <laughs> it, I do remember one thing because as I said before, I, I'm very into engineering things correctly. Mm-hmm. I was never one of the guys that, like who, the, what we used to call them hackers even in those days, who will sort of um, do things on the fly. You sit at the computer and just type and type and type and then compile and compile. I like to plan everything out and get it going. So nobody had seen anything to do with exploding fists for, oh, it must have been six, well, six weeks or whatever it was. Nothing had been happening. Everybody was starting to get a bit worried. And then one compile, and suddenly the 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 two player game that is without any AI was working straight away. So it went from nothing to a two player game basically straight away, which was. Um, and then you, you know when you're onto something because you know hit the did the compile, tested it, works. Well, we've got something here. I'll, I'll go and get a cup of coffee, and I come back, and there's a line of people to play oh, the yeah. game in the office <laughs> at my machine. So that that was when we knew we were we were onto something pretty good at that point. Why, what was, why did you choose a, a karate game, per se? Just... Well, I mean, as I said, I, had, I was aware that um, it, it, the idea initially, you know, I'd like to take credit for the idea, but the initial tweak yeah. came from the Japanese, um, the initial idea. And so then it seemed, well, if, they can, if they're going to do it for the coin-ups, well, you know, it, it seems like a good idea. I don't see why we couldn't do it for a home computer. And, you know, is this, I suppose you got to put yourself into the mindset back then. These days, every second game is either a first-person shooter or, a, or on the console, it's a beat-em-up of some nature. In those days, there wasn't any beat-em-ups. This was the, the first, what you, could, what you could even call a beat-em-up on a console. Oh, well, it wasn't a console, it was a home computer. But um, this was, and so it was, it stood out as something new, but I was actually approaching it from the simulation viewpoint mm. because one of my favourite things was always sports sims. So I was simulating karate. I was actually using correct moves and the way the human body would respond if you tried to block with those moves. I was fascinated from that viewpoint as much as anything. Um, and that, I think, came through a little bit as well. And how did you work all that out? So how would you design this then and those moves? Well, one thing in, in my games career that it's always been my constant excuse, it's, I call it research. It means, it means if I'm doing a fighting game, I can watch every Bruce Lee movie. It means if I'm doing a horror game, I can watch every horror movie. Um, we didn't get to do a porn game, unfortunately, but that would have. But anyway, um, but yeah. So I research uh, lots of um, study the the study the films, but obviously get books. I mean, and you can get books where they're photographed, you know, moves and things like that. So you use the realistic moves, um, put them into a a more, more for a better term, Hollywood sort of frame. But even the name, Way of the Exploding Fist, that's actually the English translation of Bruce Lee's fighting technique. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just a matter to give it some excitement. And the joystick manoeuvres, the 16 different types of combinations that you're able to do, was considered at its time to be you know, quite an amazing thing to be able to have all this coordination. You know yeah. how now it's so obvious, fire and whatever you might do in combination will give you things. How did that come about? The, jo- the joystick moves for first year. Um, it's funny you do mention that you know it's more obvious these days, but it's actually it's only been the last couple of versions of games like Tekken and Dead or Alive, where they're they're mapping them in a realistic way with blocking. For I think ever since Mortal Kombat, the first game came out, it w- it's been how many how fast you can bang away on buttons and things with, with beat 'em ups. Now people have actually gone back to effectively where Fist was, which is to realistically map the moves on the joystick. So if you're going to crouch, you pull down. If you're going to block, you pull back. If you're going to you know, punch high, you push up and whatever, and then you, you have a button to, to make it into a kick instead of a punch. It was all very intuitive. You didn't really need a manual. You could, you could read it. You could just um, play it and it would make sense. So it even, you know, to block and then respond. And the character would do it on screen. Even in those days, the character would actually look like he's blocking and then look like he's pushing the arm away and coming through with another punch. Um, it's it's strange how it's you know it's as soon as they dev- we we got 3D technology where it was a bit harder to do things on it to have feet standing on the spot correctly 
suddenly all the moves and that in, in fighting games did just go to push fast, push fast, and, and um, lost a little bit of realism. But now it's back, which is good to see, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, going back to the way it was originally with the fist. Yeah, well, so that's when the you thing were I... doing it, you were sort of thinking, how would this intuitively work as a Yeah, and, and it also, I also tried to have momentum in there in that, you know, if you pull the joystick back and then you, you feel like you're pushing it forward to do the punch, it, it all, everything, as far as I was concerned, made realistic sense. I mean, it made logical sense on the joystick. And that was the whole point. There wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a matter of mapping an arbitrary on there. And so, you know, you, you obviously could have 16 moves and, you, and because of the, it was sort of, the, all those joysticks in those days had eight directions effectively and you had, you had one button. So, you know, that's how it worked out. <laughs> but you, then you could, you, you could put them in the context layer. So if you pull down and the character's crouching, then anything you do after that could be a whole new eight moves, yeah. which is what we did in r r Rock and Wrestle or Bop and Wrestle, yeah. where it become context-based. Yeah. The other thing about the um, way of the exploding fist is the loading screen sound. Where did that come from? How did you do that? Was that yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the loading screen sound, well, I mean, when we see it these days, was a sample from a particular movie. It was changed a little bit, to be honest. But yes, I did. Um, I did do a few. One, I can remember one night, I think it was at my place actually, we practiced um, <laughs> what effectively was screaming and jumping around for a while. It became quite fun for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I even remember in my car park, somebody was pulling in and I come flying out of a tree of a flying karate kick, screaming as loud as I could. Oh, you've never seen somebody drive out of the yard past that, <laughs> but that was fun. But, um, yeah, no, that was a sample from a particular movie um, of quite a famous screaming one, actually, Bruce Lee one, if you want the truth be known. But, um, yeah, but the, also just imported on that was the technology that one of our one of our guys, a Greek guy, Andrew Pavlo Manolakos, developed to load sound and everything while games were loading on tape. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the, we were the first company to have what was called a fast loader because tapes, if you wanted to load, it might take half an hour. To, you know, initial Hobbit, it might have taken you know forty minutes or something to load the thing. Then we developed fast technology, and then we developed technology which lets you put pictures and sounds in it. And then it got really fancy because people started playing around with the the sound that the Commodore disc drives were making and using that to, you know, the squawk squawk. You, you could actually digitise stuff off that. We could even digitise on the white noise on the TV. We put in colour bands. The colour you saw colour bands on early loading games. Yeah. You could sync those up to get some because you know, they were changing the TV pattern. So yeah. it was all sorts of. In those days, it was all just you know. Anything well, could almost happen because you're. Anything could happen because it's it all new. You're actually you know you you might you might be the first person in the world to discover something at any one given time, and and then away you go. Did you guys actually have a sense of that? Well, I don't know about a sense of it in historical context, but certainly a sense of it in in that it was. You know, it was great fun. You were a pioneer, and you you were finding things out. The the guys like Phil Mitchell and that were reverse engineering Coleco or something, and were and were coming up with brand new ways to use it. They were getting, they were really into it from the hardware side. I mean, I wasn't so much into the hardware, although I did reverse engineer the Commodores um, video chips and do some really fun things with those, which nobody had ever done. But um, from the software side, you know, I was in from the software side inventing new techniques and that. Mm -hmm. And you were always inventing new stuff. Every game, no matter how simple and stupid the game looked, for us it was, you know, we were always doing mm. something new. Mm. And how fast did you have to, because everything seems to move so fast in terms of technology and so, I mean, things were constantly changing for you anyway. Well, it's always the case. Uh, it's in the game industry, obviously. Yeah. The, even in those days, maybe even more so in those days, the machines were ahead um, because there were so many of them in different formats. These days, there's, yes, there's a lot of different formats and they come out every two or three years and you want to do one and a half games in that period of time. But even in those days, it was still the same. We were, um, yeah, we were swamped by the, um, the the ongoing technology all the time. And um, But you never really, I don't know, you never, it didn't feel, you didn't feel like that. You're always anticipating and looking forward to something new. It always kept it alive. It's not like... You know, we're always shooting a film, and you're always using the the same camera or something. It was always they were changing the camera as well as the the technology. So I don't know. It always kept it exciting. When you were designing these games, did you look at them with that love that you had of film? So you were sort of looking at it as a story in that sort of sense as well. And Certainly, I, I was one of the early people who was really advocating and into stories in games. And obviously, that's a still an ongoing process, and it's still getting there. 
and my games after, you know, we were discussing Beam in the 80s, my games after that in Britain in particular were heavily story-based. Um, obviously, the, ga the games, the games I, I did in the 80s of Beam were more technology-based and gameplay-based. Those those, that was the decade, really, of, of um, evolving all the game play um, sort of standards and, and techniques that are really still being used today. They haven't really been improved on to any great extent. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about Aussie Games as well? What can you remember about that? Aussie Games. And what's the story with Aussie Games? <laughs> Aussie Games. I, I believe, I mean, it was that was totally from me, but I, I, my memory is very vague on some of these games. But Aussie Games, I believe, was a, um, a response to, in those days, certainly in Britain, Paul Hogan's um, success. Levy Newton-John in the States was first becoming quite big in terms of Australiana over there. But also um, a company in the States in California called Epics had, had done, um, I think they'd done summer games and maybe winter games, but they just released California games, yeah. which was, uh, as you can imagine, I don't know if you saw it, which was um, the typical things you would expect to do in California in those days, where it would be skating, skateboarding or, or surfing or, or whatever. I can't remember what the rest of the ones were. But um, so I decided to do the typical Australian events. And admittedly, they weren't too typical. They ended up being a bit weird. But I think um, we had belly flopping where you had to be a big fat guy and try and dislodge as much water as possible in as least stylish a way as possible. Uh, we had more conventionally throwing a boomerang. Um, I always remember that because it's one thing I do remember because I, I wrote a memo to an artist which said, can you um, do me a shadow on the boomerang? And the boomerang was only about two pixels, and you come back for one pixel shadow, but I was happy. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so it was... Um, then the, I suppose the most controversial one was a, it was um, geek shooting or clay pigeon shooting or whatever it was, where we had a, a couple of Outback guys in a, in a um, ute um, drinking and throwing the cans in the air and you as the player in the in standing in the back would have to shoot the cans. You could have two players. It was a two-player game, actually, which in those days was quite rare. You could have two people sitting down in the back of the ute and they had this cute little um, sheepdog in the front. Whenever you hit it, he'd do a backflip and throw up all over the over the window of the car. That seemed to get a bit... That was a bit controversial. Even in, I can remember talking to people in the United States about that. They You had to explain it a few times, and they liked it, but it, it was always a little bit... Would, would people react against that? So I never knew why. It seemed normal to me. I come from the country, it seemed normal. <laughs> so you came up with the idea for Aussie Games as a direct reaction or a bit of a piss take? Or? It, was, it, was, it was... Well, it was obvious, everything yeah. had to be commercial, yeah. point A. I, I deemed that it was had com commercial potential, um, because, but it was both a piss take and a response to something like California Games. California Games was very slick, but took itself very serious mm -hmm. to a certain degree. Um, saying that you know California the great lifestyle and this is the things they were doing so you know showed that we had a great lifestyle and these were the things we were doing <laughs> in hindsight it mightn't have been so yeah, great supported obviously by the tourism commission and <laughs> well in those days where you know we hadn't started we you know, you'd say that as a joke the tourist commission but we you know we should have got more sponsorship into some of these things and so was that that was released Aussie Games was was released in Australia, the UK, and I certainly remember talking to people in the States. I can't, I can't, I can't remember if it possibly would have been Mindscape in those days we were talking too seriously about things, but I, I don't know about the U United States. And what kind of what kind of what was the responses like here and in the UK? People. Well, I, I, I mean, in those days, how can you judge a response in Australia? There wasn't any game magazines, there wasn't right. anything. So you asked some kid in the street, he liked it. That's about all I can say on, in Australia. I mean, in the UK, it was released by US Gold, probably at just at their peak or just past their peak. Um, it got good reviews, it, 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 but obviously the Brits understand Australian humour, so that wasn't too much of an issue. It, uh, as far as I know, it went OK. It didn't, didn't set the world on fire, but it, it did, did well. <laughs> It's hilarious. What a game to put out. <laughs> yeah, well, you can put it on the Xbox 360, I suppose, if you're desperate. Yeah, that's fantastic. You still have copies of that as well? Do you, did you keep I doubt that I have copies of anything. I, I, don't, I might be able to find a copy of Exploding Fist if I um, looked hard somewhere where I've got stuff stored. Did you keep all this sort of stuff? or like Not a great deal, no. Just because you were moving around or just didn't think about it as part of... 
oh, historical just, archives. I just thought someday somebody would put me in a museum with it all, and obviously that's starting to happen. Yeah, that's so. right. Welcome to your life. This is your life. <laughs> yeah, so. You're, you're the researcher, you meant to find all this stuff. <laughs> That's right. Put it in a nice um, we'll display cabinet and then I can photograph it. <laughs> you mentioned um, the Bop and Wrestle game as well, which you... That's what it was called in the States, Bop and, and Wrestle. Rock yeah. and Rock Wrestle. Rock and Wrestle yeah. in Australia, yeah. Yeah, in Britain. And there was a character in that named Greg, wasn't it? Is that you? Named after you? There's a character called Isn't Greg. Isn't there a great character called Greg in that? I, I honestly don't know. I, I would... I, quite possibly all the wrestlers would have been named after people in in house to a certain extent. Um, because we're just, you know, you can do that in that, we can do it mm. now, you can do it anytime. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Rock and Wrestle was the first r- wrestling game that was um, a point of pride in that one. It was also the first um, game where you actually had three dimensional, if you want to call it that, movement in that you weren't just going left and right in that axis, you were going into the screen and all the moves were context based. So if you, if you, if you grab somebody, then you get a whole new set of moves. If you lift them over your head, you get a whole set of new moves. If you bang them into the ropes, you get a whole set of new set of moves. Um, again, that's n- never really been improved massively in wrestling games. Um, I do. I do actually regret in, in rock and wrestle. And the, the subsequently, we missed the boat a little bit in that because we were de- de- deemed the wrestling experts in the world. Um, people come to us to do wrestling games and, and we, we signed up with Mindscape to do a particular game which never really, I'm based on a, on a, on a, on a WWF wrestler at the time, it never really took off, but it, we, because we had a conflict of interest we turned down a claim when they came over and said well, can you do the first WWF game, which of course has turned into the biggest, not just wrestling franchise, but one of the biggest game franchises ever. Um, so. Unreal. So, um, and what was, uh, and aside from it being the first wrestling game, um, it had a soundtrack, that specially made soundtrack for it or something like that as well? Uh, well, I, well, all the soundtracks were specially yeah. made. If you're implying that it had a, um, a rock sound, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think we went, we, we might have done some original songs. In the States, we might have even bought some songs yeah. in. Um, I, I, I'm pretty vague on that. But I, I don't remember doing anything beyond the norm because obviously one of the things in in these early games it's all commonplace now but with music and sound and also graphics like you know one thing we didn't touch on was i can actually remember when we hired the first artist i mean you know people didn't use artists to do games that was why would you use somebody who could draw pictures to do a game that was not seen as a thing to do in the in the early 80s and then i think it was even me had this bright idea oh, what if we hire an artist Everybody Which looked at me for? like I was an idiot. Uh, it would have been... Uh, well, it, would have, it was before Fist, because we had t- two artists working for us then. It might have been to turn The Hobbit into a, into yes. a proper graphic, because we had two versions of The Hobbit. The original one was um, all the pictures were effectively what was called 128 bytes, which is, you know, it's, mm. if, if, you, if you have Outlook on your desktop, every address in Outlook is 128 bytes. <laughs> or, or, no, every one line of an address, your street address is 128 bytes. So that each picture in The Hobbit was, you know, effectively that. And um, they were done by, by saying, point here, draw a line there, draw a line there, draw a line there, draw a line there, then fill that in colour green, and you've got the, the Hobbit's door. So on and so on. All the pictures were done like that. So we had the bright idea, let's actually, you know, do proper pictures for The Hobbit. You know, people love that. Uh, so I think that's when we decided to hire, a, hire an artist and started using him from there. And it was the same with music in that, because programmers, getting back on the art mm-hmm. thing, I actually, you know, we did the, I did the art for Hungry Horace. But, you know, 16 pixels, this Horace character, blue <laughs> pixels of Horace, yeah, <laughs> moving, and then you animate his leg. It was like, you know, flipping a book of animation. Uh, so that was before artists were used, yeah. But um, it was the same with audio, the same with sound. You know, it, that didn't come on until we started doing the proper version of The Hobbit. The second version, the, the disc version with the pretty pictures, we also decided to hire musicians. Mm-hmm. And obviously then it goes on and on and on, you, and, and you hire musicians who can do original stuff, and then you might buy songs. I don't think in the 80s we bought songs from people, but obviously in subsequent years I was buying songs from Polygram and Sony mm-hmm. and everybody. Which change is different again, but like when you have it all in house, your artist in house, new musician in house, creating specifically for the games. Is that yeah. How, yeah. Yeah. And well, how did your inspiration work for the games? Were you, for example, interested in the sport first, and then thought I'll make the game for that? Or were you really always, were you guys always really looking at what's happening, what's going to come out next by someone else, and trying to beat it that way? Uh, 
No, we weren't really looking preemptively at the market. Or I, I certainly wasn't looking preemptively, preemptively at the market, and certainly not competing with other people. You might, you, certainly, from my point of view, I always um, kept totally au fait with everything in film, TV, whatever, or all pop culture. It was, you know, even though you didn't call it pop culture then or didn't know you were doing it, you were actually doing it, and then you become, you, you did it specifically, and purposefully. Um, but no, it was always, from my point of view specifically, it was always game design. It was that was my major interest, doing something that would, a, be appealing to the general public, but b, actually be you know something new from a game design mm-hmm. viewpoint, something interesting. That's why Fist came along. That's mm-hmm. why Rock and Wrestle came along, um, in those days, and even Aussie Games to a certain extent, because it was my take on, because all those all those the Epics games in those days, California Games, Summer Games were. The you know the joystick twiggling pr- button pressing thing. So it was just my take on doing that as well. So. Mm. Mm. <coughs> um, just wanted to ask you as well. Like then, how did you see? Because it's quite a few things changed, obviously, in the over ten plus years that you were there in Beam, the Melbourne House. So you saw from the first you know artist, the first musician coming through, and all that sort of stuff. How did that change the way the games were being done there? Uh, well, obviously, from our point of view, from starting with, or well, from my point of view, more because obviously the um, the Hobbit, Phil and Co had a, had a small team. Then, um, from my point of view, as you start off as an individual, it's it's a lot of what there were some individuals in Australia, but mainly in say Britain, where people were actually programming games in their bedrooms or in their garage or wherever else. I mean, hell, Apple and Atari started like that. So from I was I was coming from that background where I was one person doing the whole thing, and then you know I'm not, I'm not a great artist or a great musician, but and then you you know you could have people on your team who were obviously ten times better at you at art and music and stuff. So it seemed like a natural progression, and, and those teams were still small. I mean, at the most you'd have two artists on a game in the eighties, in the at least early to mid eighties, um, and you, you have you have a single guy doing the music, so. You know, and he may have a support programmer. So a team might be five people or something. Yeah, you know, even for a, a big game. Unbelievable. And then that, when does that start to change then at, at Melbourne House? At Melbourne House, well, the teams, the games grow bigger, the teams grow bigger, mm-hmm. the machines grow bigger. I suppose the if you want a pivotal moment, it would be the release of the NES, and then Nintendo kept internal control of that machine in terms of software. So. I believe there was us at Beam and Rare in the UK that reverse engineered the NES and started doing games for it. And then, obviously, that's also really the point where we started getting a lot of commission work because obviously, if you can write, if you can do work for the console, then everybody mm. from Konami down was coming to us to do mm. work. Whereas before, because we were a publisher, you have to bear in mind, Melbourne House was one of the two biggest publishers in the UK. So we, we were doing software for our own publishing needs and then we would license it off to people in the States, mm. um, which was never, ironically, the biggest market. The UK was always the biggest market. It was a concentrated market. So when Japan opened up and brought out the NES and, and then that sort of was the big catalyst to, for everything, for mm. commissioning work, for bigger teams, for whatever you want. Mm. That's really... Yeah. And obviously, I can go back to Aussie Games yeah. you mentioned before, yeah. that obviously... I seem to remember two or three programmers. There were six gamettes, so there was probably three programmers doing two each or something. So, but that obviously divided up really nicely. I yeah. mean, they were totally standalone. Yeah, yeah. And how did the programming process work then? So you, you would have a game that you would focus on. You'd have your team that would work on that, or someone had a master plan of the games that were coming out, or well, the, well, it depends what what well, what part of the eighties we're talking about. It, it, the um, from my point of view, I. I well, I started off obviously programming and programming and designing whatever I worked on. I don't know. To be fair, I started off by converting the Hungry Horace and the Hobbit. I think then I did. Um, I sort of did from scratch an original version of Horace Goes Skiing, and then in between that, uh, the the pretty version of the Hobbit, the disc version. And then I said, well, I'm going to do something original. And that's when I did Exploding Fist, and then from that point on, it was all you know, my stuff was all my stuff really. Um, uh, I don't even know what the question was. But. <laughs> so that so you would basically you were allowed in, to have control, choose a game that you'd like to work on, and run with it. Yeah, well, in those it, days. yeah, well, that's yeah. Well, at that point, I, I was after exploding fist. I was obviously pretty senior there anyway. 
and eventually moved from programming. It was about that mid to late 80s, really didn't do much programming as, as, as a side to design, direct and produce, just not one title, more than one title, two or three titles at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the NES came out, sort of specifically produced, direct and design without um, programming. I don't think I did much programming until in the early 90s on Discworld. So, mm. um, yeah. Mm. Just moving into that just quickly. So some of the things that you've seen and you've seen the changes in the industry and so you've moved, you know, obviously moved through from Beam into a various number of positions overseas doing some of the Well, I, I set up my own company, Perfect Entertainment, in the UK um, from from about 93 to about 2000. Mm -hmm. We... Um, we ended, up, we, we ended up closing down, we got into a big dispute with Sony, which um, when you sit in, a, in an office in central London and, and you're in the middle of a dispute and you come into a room and then Sony comes in and they sat down with, I don't know, it must have been eight, nine lawyers in suits. And the lead one said, got up and said, look, I just want to tell you, we've just screwed George Michael for a fortune mm -hmm. and now we're happy we're going to screw you guys. <laughs> It didn't work out. We settled, but uh, anyway, we got. We, it's a separate yeah, thing. We didn't. Yeah. We got. We got into a case with them where one of the Sony's companies had offered us a lot of work on the Sega Saturn to do, and um, and they said, "But you've got to expand, expand big time." So we expanded a couple of million dollars worth of expanding, and um, then Sony said, "Hang on, one of our companies is commissioning Saturn work. We don't like that. We're cancelling the contract. We're tearing it up. Sue us." It's <laughs> unbelievable. So that went on for a couple of years, but anyway. Yeah. So after that, I, I, I worked for um, Empire Interactive in the UK. They wanted the studio set up in Oxford, and I set that up for them, and did a, we did a big game up there. Mm -hmm. But that's also one of the sagas of the Empire. Empire's a small publisher and having troubles and things. Mm. So that was when I decided it's time to come back. And do your own thing, yeah. Well, I'll get out of games for a little while, to be honest. Mm. Um, it's a big commitment now to do a game. It's, you know, you're committing yourself for two years to a lot of work. So I thought I'll see how things go and also just see how things are down here. And what would you say, like, uh, I suppose, in some sort of way of, of contextualising Melbourne House and Beam, from your observations of having been overseas in programming and things, that the importance or the role of Beam and Melbourne House in early gaming development? Uh, Melbourne House Stroke Beam, obviously one of the the key early players in the industry, one, or the earliest, one of the the earliest. We, we, bearing in mind the well, the in industry started obviously in small in, in America, in Britain, Australia, Japan, whatever. But in the world sense, there was the general feeling, certainly from us, that the UK was the game market for some reason, and um, it certainly had the most. Um, developers and publishers in those days. And Melbourne House, along with Ocean, US Gold a little bit down the track, um, were you know there at the start, effectively. Um, Fred started the company quite early. He did some computer game books, just you know, type in, type in your basic games for the Spectrum or the VIC-20 or whatever, and then evolved it into games and then publishing games. And um, it... I, I suppose it definitely has a place, a major place in the history of the of the game industry, really. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's recognised or seen as such? And well, it, cer it certainly isn't the people that have been in the industry for a while. That these days, um, or not that these days, the last half dozen years, to be honest, the you know obviously it's a different. There's a lot of young people who 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 to them the old days are the PS2 or you know if you're lucky the the PS1 or the Nintendo if you're really lucky. But it's a so it's a different industry, and and they you know it's like coming into any you know if you're coming into the film industry or something these days, you know you wouldn't be referring to the black and white days so much, um, and it's the same thing. You 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 sort of um, you're treated with reverence by people that know, and um, and and you know other people are surprised that there was a you know that the games haven't always been there that there was the pioneering days. So. So it is strange, but yeah, there's still a lot of people who are, you know, fans, for want of a better term, of the old days. You, you might turn up to a party or something, at an industry one, and, you know, suddenly somebody will mention Exploding Fist and then everybody goes crazy or something. Exploding Fist is definitely one of the big remembered games, certainly in the UK. Um, it's considered one of the sort of seminal games over there. They do 
everybody everybody in the industry knows about that and you know there's you do get a lot of um requests for a console version these days even from just the public so. and why do you think there is such an interest in obviously exploding fist but even we were talking earlier about even some of the earlier other games well, well the early other games are known i suppose but it's these days well in the last few years there's been a trend to go back retro gaming for various reasons um, people got back to the you know the old like um, quite a few developers now are doing packs of you know asteroids and space invaders and whatever you, whatever for those days and stuff like fist and I, I don't think the Horus games quite come into it. people in the industry in Britain remember the Horus games just because they were the first half dozen games on a home computer um, but I don't know whether they remember be for anything great but they certainly just remember because you know, obviously, you're going to remember the first half dozen things these days with a thousand games from PlayStation One or something. You know, you're only going to remember Wipeout or something and leave it at that. But so it it does have that sort of value, I suppose. Yeah, it's good. It's great. Yeah, I just want to ask a question because a lot of your peers talk about you as a as a game designer, like one of the first game designers. Now, obviously, um, there was no job description for game designer around really at the time. Still. And, and we're getting an idea that some of it came out of your interest in the movies, but um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what inspired you and, and how, how you put games together when there really wasn't any sort of pro forma or, or yeah, well, way of thinking about it? In terms of game design, in terms, there, there still to this day isn't the equivalent of a screenplay, obviously. I mean, there isn't really the equivalent of, in the comic book industry, a very rough you know, screenplay, which has many formats. But um, if I, from my point of view of game design, it was always interesting both, well, even in those days from the cinematic and storytelling standpoint, but obviously that was a secondary concern and that's become more important in the 90s when you could actually tell a story and you could be cinematic in the way you told it. But it was, the game design was sort of a mixture of simulating something, which I was always interested in sports simulation of any nature. I was always interested in the computer programming aspect of simulating, you know, the real world or whatever. And this was a way of, of designing an interaction to that. I mean, to put it in a silly way, I suppose, but it was just, for me, it was always fascinating. I was one of the first people fascinated, I suppose, by the interface of a game or of, of a piece of software via a joystick or something to a person and what you could do with it. And, you know, whether it be Exploding Fist or even Hungry Horus, I think I would actually walk around with a joystick in my hands, just, you know, testing things. And, you know, it might be a day at hand, just work, work around with a joystick in my hand. I might have even given it a name, but I, what did, I can't remember. But, um, so, it would all, it, I was just always fascinated by that. It always seemed, you know, film was my starting point of fascination. But it, it it's even, you know, from when I started in, in the early 80s to now, you know, film from a technological viewpoint hasn't changed all that much. It's changed in ways which make it easier for, like as we can see here, easier for, you know, anybody to make a particular film. But the actual process hasn't changed that much. Whereas with game, it, with games, we always had the feeling that the software, the technology, the hardware, and the ways you could use it was always going to change, and it, and it still is changing. I mean, it, it, you know, we we had that pivotal moment a few, you know, well, ten years ago or so when it became three D. That opened up the whole new. First the software was using 3D techniques, then the hardware and the chip stack doing it all in 3D. So the whole, you know, what you can do changes and people are no longer thinking the most realistic, the most effective way to make a realistic looking computer game is to film it as they were in the mid to late 80s. You had Sierra and people filming, even even Beam at one point filmed, I think just after I left, um, filming it or by using ultra realistic animation. Um, removing the stylism, just going for ultra realism. Then the three D thing opened up, and they could see, well, you know, you can take that to the logical extreme. You can actually simulate the whole world if you want to, or you can be stylistic about it. Um, but anyway, to answer your original question, game design was just something that was an eternal fascination to me. It still is. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, is that it? Is it? Yeah, it's creatively yeah. painless. Sure. That was great. That was it's really, really we're really Thank interested you. in the Aussie games too. That was good. Do you mind if I email you maybe with some maybe follow up or questions? No, no, it's all that that's okay? easy. Yeah, that's easy. That, that would be fantastic. Just some things that might come as I'm listening back to it and things like that. Yeah, well, I think and gaps that we might. Have.